This episode was made possible by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to begin monetizing your podcast, whether you're big or small. Podgo provides podcasters with a flat rate for ad space, so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member and you can too. Apply today at podgo.co to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's p-o-d-g-o dot c-o. Hi M&Ms, just to let you know that I have a promo of another podcast that I would love for you to go over and listen to playing at the very end of this episode. So please make sure you stay tuned until then to hear it. Warning, this episode contains description that some listeners may find distressing. So listener discretion is strongly advised. Hi M&Ms, welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. Cannibalism is the act of a human consuming the flesh of another human. The practice of cannibalism, also known as anthropophagy, dates back to early human history, but coined its name after a West Indies tribe, the Carib, who were well known to have eaten the flesh of their acquaintances. The Spanish name for the Carib, who could be located in Southern America, is Garibales or Cannibales, which is where the term cannibalism derived from. Cannibalism is practiced all across the world for different reasons. Some see it as ritualistic. Australian Aboriginals viewed it as an act of respect for the deceased. And for some, it's just a means to an end in a dire situation when no other food is available. Joseph Roy Metheny was born on the 2nd of March 1955 in Baltimore, Maryland. It would later be revealed that Joe had a poor upbringing. His alcoholic father died in a car accident when Joe was just six years old, and it's reported that his mother would work double shifts and leave the six kids in the home alone. What took part during the majority of his childhood remains a mystery. While Joe claimed that his mother often sent him to live with other families in foster-like arrangements, his mother contended that although they were somewhat poor and she had to work three jobs, they had a normal family life. She argues that the family never went hungry or became homeless, and that they never had to rely on government welfare, and also refuted Joe's claims that they were sent to live with other families. His mother recalls Joe as being a polite, above-average student who was never rude and remarked that he had, quote, a good childhood. If he was neglected, it was his own fault. It was a pretty good home, end quote. When Joe turned 18, he joined the army in 1973. Again, accounts are conflicted, with Joe's mother claiming he served in Germany and Joe contending he served a tour in Vietnam and became addicted to heroin. Joe's military records have never been publicly released to corroborate either claim. Either way, Joe did develop a drug addiction, and by the 90s he was living on the streets of South Baltimore and spending the majority of the money he earned as a forklift driver on crack cocaine, heroin and alcohol. In fact, this was just the beginning of a downward spiral that would lead to a vicious two-year killing spree. In the 90s, Joe Metheny was known by friends and associates as Tiny. 
Tiny was an incredibly ironic nickname, considering his six foot one stature and overweight build. Despite Joe being addicted to drugs and alcohol throughout his adulthood, Joe was commonly described as intelligent, well spoken, and very well mannered. However, there was a much darker side to him, a side that would reveal itself fully in the mid 90s. In July 1994, Joe's drug addict wife upped and left one night with their son, which infuriated him. Joe would later go on to say that he was not angered by his wife leaving him. Quote, she was a crack addict and a worthless piece of shit. I would have paid to get her out of my life. End quote. But he was enraged by the fact that she'd taken their six-year-old son with her. According to Joe's later confession, he discovered about six months after she left him that his wife had moved across town and was, quote, out selling her ass for drugs, end quote. At some point, Joe's wife and her new boyfriend were caught by police for possessing drugs, and Joe's six-year-old son was taken off his mother by social services for neglect and child abuse. Joe had a criminal record and knew there was no possibility of social services handing his son over to him, so instead he decided to take revenge. Quote, I took it upon myself with the hatred I had for these two who lost my son to go looking for them. I had found out from someone that they was going under that bridge and getting high with some homeless motherfuckers who lived under that bridge. End quote. Once he knew where his wife had moved, it was fairly easy for him to locate the place she'd been staying, a homeless campsite under Baltimore's Hanover Street Bridge. He headed there but instead of finding his wife, he instead found two homeless men, 33-year-old Randall Brewer and Randy Piker, who knew she'd done drugs with them before. Quote, They were passed out on some old stinking mattress, and that's where they were when I left, except they were dead from being chopped up. End quote. That same night, Joe lured 39-year-old Kathy Ann Magazina under the bridge, Kathy was a drug addict and prostitute. Joe claims he was trying to extract information from Kathy about his wife's whereabouts, but when she claimed she had no idea where she was, he, quote, beat the hell out of her and raped her ass, then killed her, end quote. Whilst copies of this confession are in several sources that I found, as far as I can tell, it's never been verified as definitely being written by Joe Metheny, so I apologise in advance if any information is incorrect. According to the confession, Joe then repeated this act with another woman, but I can't find any other sources that corroborates this. After killing Kathy, Joe realised there was a fisherman nearby who may have witnessed the crime, so he murdered him too. Several different sources state the following events differently. Some say that Joe then weighed the bodies down with rocks and threw the bodies into the Patapsco River that ran underneath the bridge. However, other reports state that Joe buried Kathy's body in a shallow grave on the site he worked at and reportedly dug up her skull some months later. Again, accounts vary of what he did with the skull. Some say he cleaned it off and had sex with it, Others say he put it in a box and threw it in the trash. Quote, that was a very busy night for me, five murders within about seven hours. I washed up in that river and cleaned up this crime scene as much as I could, then left. End quote. Just two weeks after the murders, Joe was arrested for the murders of Randall Brewer and Randy Piker and spent 18 months in the county jail before the trial began in early 1996. Due to a lack of physical evidence, Joe was acquitted of the murders in July 1996, even though he later admitted his guilt. Once free, Joe got his job back at the pallet company and even managed to persuade his boss to let him live on a trailer that was on site and he would, quote, keep an eye on the place, end quote. The confession went on to state, quote, He agreed to this and gave me the keys to the front gate and the main building. The company was on a dead-end road and was very isolated. It was perfect for what I wanted to do, end quote. 
just months after he was acquitted for the two murders of the homeless men, Joe lured and stabbed to death 26-year-old Kimberly Lynn Spicer in mid-November 1996. Joe then dismembered the body, but instead of burying it or throwing it in the river, he butchered it, removing the meaty parts of her body and placing the pieces in the freezer in Tupperware containers. He then buried the remains in several different places in the woods behind the grounds of the company. Over the next few weeks, Joe mixed the flesh with beef and pork and made them into patties. Quote, Over the next couple weeks on the weekends, I opened up a little open pit beef stand. I had real roast beef and pork sandwiches, and why not, they were very good. The human body tastes very similar to pork. If you mix it together, no one can tell the difference. Everything was going pretty good until I ran out of my special meat, end quote. Joe was selling the patties on a barbecue stand he'd set up on the side of the road to truck drivers and passersbys, who were completely unaware that what they were consuming was actually human flesh. It was when Joe ran out of meat that he lured Rita Kemper back to his trailer on the 8th of December 1996. Quote, I got her in there and started to rip her clothes off and knock in the hell out of her. She was screaming, but there was no one around to hear her except me, and I just kept on laughing at her. End quote. There, he tried to rape her after she refused to have sex with him. However, according to Joe's confession, he turned his back for two seconds and Rita managed to escape the deranged clutches of Joe and ran from the trailer. Quote, there was an eight-foot chain link fence with barbed wire on top of it around the front of the company. There was a stack of wooden pallets next to the fence about ten feet high. That bitch scaled those pallets like a monkey and jumped the fence and ran down to the main road where some guy in a pickup truck picked her up and took her to a nearby gas station where they called the cops, end quote. It was also later revealed that Joe had threatened to murder Rita, as he had with the other girls. Needless to say, Rita had an extremely lucky escape. Joe Metheny, who weighed 500 pounds at the time, was subsequently arrested and readily confessed to the murders he had committed. There's also some confusion over when he was arrested. Some sources state that it was the same night he attempted to kidnap Rita, and that's what his confession states. However, other sources report that he wasn't arrested until the 15th of December when he asked a friend to help him bury Kimberly's body. He showed no remorse for the way he'd brutally murdered and disposed of these women. However, did state, quote, The only thing... I feel bad about in any of this, is I didn't get to murder the two motherfuckers I was really after, and that's my ex-old lady and the bastard she got hooked up with, end quote. He also told police that he refused to apologise to the families of the victims, as the apology would be a lie. In his confession, he stated, quote, My murder rampage started out as revenge, but ended up as a passion for the taste of blood, and the overwhelming sense of power one gets for taking the life of another. End quote. Three days after his arrest, Joe took the police to the location he'd buried Kimberly, and although she'd been decapitated, they were able to identify her using dental records. At some point, he was indicted for the murder of 28 year old Tony Lynn Ingracia, however, these charges were later dropped due to a lack of evidence. Joe also claimed to have killed three more prostitutes along the Washington Boulevard in Baltimore and throwing their bodies in the Patapsco River. Whilst Joe takes responsibility for committing ten murders overall, there's no evidence to corroborate some of these claims, including the three women along Washington Boulevard. In 1997, Joe was tried and convicted for the kidnapping and attempted assault of Rita Kemper, and was sentenced to 50 years imprisonment. In 1998, he stood trial for the murder of Kimberly Lynn Spicer, and was once again convicted, this time receiving a death sentence. At the sentencing hearing, Joe told the court that he committed the murders because, quote, he enjoyed it, got a rush out of it, got a high out of it, end quote. 
and that, quote, he had no real excuse why, other than a like to do it, end quote. In August 1998, Joe was handed a life sentence for the murder of Kathy Ann Magaziner. In 2000, his death sentence for Kimberly's murder was reduced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. His confession ended with, quote, Well, that's my story, horrible but true. So the next time you're riding down the road and you happen to see an open pit beef stand that you've never seen before, make sure you think about this story before you take a bite of that sandwich. Sometimes you may never know who you may be eating. Ha <laughs> ha. End quote. At 3pm on the 5th of August 2017, Joe Metheny was found dead in his prison cell at the Western Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland, at the age of 62. Joe Metheny was a dangerous individual, particularly due to his modus operandi, or I guess lack thereof. Joe's victims varied to some degree, and the manner in which he murdered wasn't consistent either. Some he stabbed, others he beat. Even the disposal of the bodies was different amongst the murders he committed. His refreshing honesty also made him an unusual character. However, his arrogance and complete lack of remorse simply make him the same as any other serial killer I've covered or will cover in the future. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review, and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod, and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www.murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com. Have a great week, and I'll see you all next week for another episode. Hey listeners, if you're tuning into this show, one, you have good taste, and two, you might enjoy another show that we host called Death by Champagne, the podcast here to keep you up at night. I'm Mackenzie. And I'm Olivia. We have topics in all realms, from the reality of true crime to the depths of the occult. We have dozens of episodes to binge that range from hair-raising scares to infuriating miscarriages of justice. We've covered everything from the origins of Satan to the crimes of an unidentified serial killer in our hometown of St. Louis. Other episodes include tales of unsolved mysteries, murder investigations, disappearances, cold cases, hauntings, folklore, and people in history that are stranger than fiction. In Season 3, you can join us for a true crime book club, giving in-depth coverage on cases living in the darkest corners of our bookshelves. Our first multi-part series is on the crimes of Gary Ridgway, focusing on his family, victims, and survivors. So grab your cat keychain, surround yourself in a salt circle, lock your doors, and unlock that phone. Hail Satan. And pop some bottles.